our friend Howie Rose joins us on Hot Stove on this day. Uh, Howie, good morning. Since you are intimately yes. familiar with what Carlos Mendoza is about to undertake, <laughs> this job, uh, tell us about what you, th what you see as being his, his first orders of business. What are the first challenges that a new Mets manager has to deal with? Well, obviously, some of that has already been mitigated through the discussions that he's had with David Stearns leading up to his being offered the job, and that is what the dynamic is going to be internally. But as far as handling New York and the media and all of those inherent pressures, he has a bit of a head start in that he's been the bench coach for the Yankees, and so he understands at least to a, a minimal effect how that all works. He's never been the guy right in the middle of the bullseye, if you will. So it's going to be interesting to see how he ultimately handles that, because you're talking about two press conferences a day before a large throng of people, one before the game, one after the game, and they will make him aware of every single move he made <laughs> within the scope of that night's game and how it might have turned out. But again, I think he has a little bit of a jump start on that, having been in the dugout in New York. And I, in a high-profile situation, even if it wasn't his profile. Yeah, Howie, the one thing I think, uh, clearly the New York media is the biggest challenge for the manager, but also the schedule. He's gone from now the bench coach guy, get everybody ready, walk around, shake hands, hit some fungos, to you are – it's not just two press conferences. You are constantly having to talk to media. And it takes away almost, I think, now more so than ever before – your time to prep for the game. So what would your advice be to Carlos? Get to bed as early as you can and get to the ballpark as early as you can. Because you're right. I mean, the whole – look, when you were playing, my guess is, Harold, and it wasn't that long ago, you probably had one bus going to the ballpark. Most of the guys were on it. The manager might have gotten there for a 7 o'clock game, say around 3 o'clock or so. Uh, that's all different now. I mean, I see the manager and his coaching staff downstairs in the hotel, 1130 in the morning, 12 noon, on their way out to the ballpark. There's just so much that needs to be digested and absorbed before a game starts. The game almost becomes the escape. And how hmm. Carlos is able to handle all of, you know, how he handles all of those uh, ancillary factors in preparing for a game before it even starts, is going to, I think, tell us a lot, too, about how things turn out. That's a, that's a really good point to make. Yeah. You know, the, we, we put up um, uh, a lineup earlier, Howie, on the show about kind of the year that the, the Mets had and what they ended the season with, one through nine. Harold's take was that it's going to look a lot different between now and opening day. Uh, your thoughts on this group and where you think there might be some changes? Well, let's start with uh, your number five hitter, Daniel Vogelback, who is a candidate to be non-tendered. I'm not saying that he will be, because you have to remember David Stearns had him in Milwaukee. He brought him there. But I would certainly think that his spot is vulnerable. Starling Marte is a big question mark. He didn't play a big chunk of last year as he recovered from uh, groin surgery. And D.J. Stewart, well, they caught a little lightning in a bottle with him for a, about a two-week or so stretch. Uh, cooled off at the end. I wouldn't guarantee that he's got a roster spot. And I think Brett Beatty, by any objective measure, was disappointing in that the Mets expected more. He eventually became the everyday third baseman, but wound up back in the minor leagues for a while. I think, you know, you're pretty well set uh, whether they hit in this order or not with Nemo, McNeil, Lindor. I firmly believe Alonzo is going to be there at the beginning of the season as he enters into his walk here. And Francisco Alvarez will probably be more of a middle-of-the-order hitter now. But let me tell you something. Steve Cohen did not spend $2.4 billion to buy this team a few years ago and to spend the money he did to buy down the contracts of Verlander and Scherzer, among others, you know, to put the 1978 Mets on the field next year. That's not going to happen. <laughs> They're going to be aggressive if it's not a roster that necessarily profiles as a candidate to win 100 games as they did what will be just two years before, so be it. But as we've seen the last couple of years, your National League champion Arizona Diamondbacks won 84 games. And before that, the National League champions of 2022, the Philadelphia Phillies won 87 games. I have absolutely no doubt that the Mets will have a club 
that is uh, certainly in line to win at least that many games as you look at them come opening day. But, you know, along those lines, and I, I'm curious what you think about this, we see teams sometimes spend, misfire, and then mm -hmm. kind of rethink their course. Uh, now we're going to draft and develop. We tried the free agency route. This group that owns the Mets right now, because the – the financial largesse is something that we've never seen before in the industry. Is there any buyer's remorse on the deals for Scherzer and Verlander that didn't quite work out the way they thought, or are they going to spend the same way this winter? I don't know that you'll see. Well, you know, I, I want to hedge on that, too. And hedge is the key word, basically, because, you know, <laughs> Steve Cohen, who with his wife Alex owns the Mets, uh, made his money in hedge funds. And basically, what did he do at the trade deadline? He hedged his bets. He knew that um, chances were that that three-week run that the Mets needed to get back into contention in, uh, you know, around the uh, uh, trade deadline was unlikely to happen. At least that's the assessment they made. So he reevaluated his assets. And don't forget, it's not just that he moved Verlander and Scherzer. He paid a huge amount of that money down and was able to restock the farm system to a large extent. I doubt that you'll see, although, again, uh, I have to hedge, to use the key word, uh, that profile of contract, meaning a veteran pitcher, short-term big deal. I do think, though, they will be very, very active in pursuing Yamamoto, the 25-year-old, and that's the key, the 25-year-old Japanese pitcher who appears to be, from all indications, a stud. So I think they're going to be in on him. And whether they're in on, I just saw the segment that uh, JP did about Juan Soto. The Mets were not in the top three. I wouldn't necessarily rule them out on that. Um, and they've got to make a decision about Pete Alonso beyond next year, too. Um, but they're not, going to, they're not going to be throwing, you know, pennies around like manhole covers. Uh, that, that's not going to be the M.O. There's a little bit of retooling going on. But they're still in position where if there's a, a prime player that's going to cost some money, they'll be involved if he's a good fit. Hey, I want to circle back and end where we started with the manager. You know, the, the Mets, I, I think they're at a point where they need stability, right? That's the word I want to use. And you look at what's happened in the last five, six years, you know it better than me. We've had a carousel throughout that door. You know, and Buck wins 180 games in two years and you're out the door. So... How much leeway does Carlos have in really building the stability? I know David Stern's going to be going his own direction now. He's new. But stability is a key. So I, I, my, my question after saying all that, Howie, is how do the Mets get stability moving forward? What do you see? Win. Win in April. Win in May. Win in June. That's how you build the stability. The thing of it is, what's really going to be intriguing to me, guys, is that uh, David Stearns has never hired a manager before. Now, he had a great relationship by all indications with Craig Council in Milwaukee. But when Stearns became the head of baseball operations there, he inherited Council. So this was the first managerial hiring that David made and, or has made. And he's got a pretty firm idea in his mind about the nature and specifics of the relationship as it pertains to, here's that word now, analytics and how they prepare for a game. Uh, I can't sit here and tell you today uh, how much leeway Carlos is going to have in looking at all of that data that they have to absorb before a game and allowing the heartbeat of the game rather than a script to dictate what moves are going to be made. Because I guarantee you those questions are going to be asked at the press conference later today. And whatever the answer is, throw it out because neither <laughs> man has ever been you know, in, in this particular position before. Um, but I just for what it's worth, I've always felt, and I think that we've seen this with the amount of older managers that have not only been hired recently, but have succeeded, that you do have to pay homage to the heartbeat of a game. And I would hope that Carlos is going to have some latitude to be able to move away from what we might consider as the script and make a decision based on how that particular game appears to be unfolding. They'll answer those questions today. I don't know that they mean a hill of beans until the season starts and we see how it plays out. And we'll see how things go at uh, noon Eastern today. Howie, we always love having you on the show, man, for whatever reason. We appreciate so, your time and uh, hope to talk with you again soon. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Always fun.